Dr. Bowen back here with you for another session of Microbiology Bootcamp. Our topic today is the infamous Clostridium botulinum, which is the causative agent of botulism. This is the second of our four Clostridium species that we're going to talk about. And this one is, like I said, very important because it causes a major disease, which is implicated in public health. And it's implicated because you see it in foodborne illness. So you may see it as part of a manufacturer recall of canned goods, or you might see it in a uh, restaurant, and it can pop up in a, like a little mini epidemic in a town associated with that restaurant. All right, now we've gotten really good at preventing botulism, uh, but another way that you can see this is by improperly canned foods that you make at home. Okay, so we'll get into that. We'll get into the toxin and how it works. Uh, this is very important. On step one, you will likely be tested on how the toxin works. It's fairly easy to diagnose botulism on exams, which is not anything like how real life is, uh, but they'll probably give you a buzzword like canned foods or a floppy baby or something like that that makes it really obvious that it's botulism, but then they'll ask you how the what the mechanism is behind the the toxin or the disease process. So that's probably how it will come up for you. Uh, if you haven't considered it yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can get there by clicking the link below or on the i button up here. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free and coming. Uh, otherwise, feel free to subscribe to my channel or patronize my advertisers. I really appreciate it. So thank you very much in advance. Now let's get into the more interesting stuff instead of my little commercial. Uh, this is the gram positive characteristics versus gram negative. This is very testable for boards, so I really suggest that you know this well uh, if you're taking step one. If you aren't familiar with this, uh, go back and watch my general characteristics of gram positive bacteria. I do a whole video on that uh, and talk about this in detail. This is how the gram stain works. Again, something that is testable for step one. We're going to go into our algorithm here with C. botulinum. You should have an algorithm sitting in front of you uh, because you'll want to know it cold. Have all this information very organized because this is how microbiology questions come up on board. So they give you a vignette, you know the bacteria that's behind it, and then they'll ask you, is it catalase positive or catalase negative? Bass tracin sensitive, bass tracin resistant, and so forth. Not stuff that's important clinically, but this is how they give it to you on step one. We'll talk about the toxin, and then we'll talk about the disease processes that uh, this causes, and then uh, we'll briefly go into the therapeutic uses of botulinum toxin. That makes this toxin fairly unique because we have an application for it clinically. And then I put together a little story for you. Hopefully you find that useful. All right, now this is our gram-positive algorithm. I blew up the gram-positive bacilli here. Clostridium is the one species you need to know that's an obligate anaerobe of the gram-positive bacilli. Okay, and so these are all gram-positive spore-forming rods. Uh, so you'll look on your microscope and you'll see gram-positive rods, and then you'll know that it's either an aerobe or an anaerobe, and then you'll, uh, if they, they'll, they'll likely tell you this is an anaerobe or an aerobe. And if it's an anaerobe, then you know it's clostridium. Uh, or they might tell you that it forms spores. Uh, so we have four members of the clostridium species that you need to be familiar with for step one. And this one is clostridium botulinum. I put here on the little algorithm what I think are the most important things that you need to know for each of these bacteria. But you can find these algorithms everywhere. Just type in gram-positive algorithm on an image search on Google and you'll find all sorts of these. It doesn't really matter as long as you have a systematic way of differentiating these bacteria. So you should know that Clostridium botulinum is a gram-positive bacilli, it's an obligate anaerobe like all Clostridium species, and that it forms a spore. And all a spore is is it's bacterial hibernation. So when conditions get really bad for bacteria, like uh, it's really hot or uh, it might be that there's not a lot of, of food sources for the bacteria, 
what it can do is it goes into hibernation. It preserves its genome around this, this spore hull, and it can wait until the conditions are better for the bacteria. And then it'll come out of its spore, and it'll germinate, and, and it can cause disease that way. So we'll see how that is important when we talk about infantile botulism. The toxin of Clostridium botulinum is called the botulinum toxin. Very creative, right? And it works very similar to the tetanus toxin, tetanospasmin. And the reason it's similar is that they both cleave snare proteins. Now, a snare protein is a, a protein, really it's a family of proteins, that sit on vesicles inside neurons. And what will happen is that that snare protein is really useful when it's necessary for when that vesicle wants to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release the neurotransmitters into the uh, in, into the, the synaptic cleft. Now with tetanospasmin, we saw how that worked, right? It travels up the lower motor neuron and then takes up residence in the spinal cord. With this one, it's a lot easier. It just goes to the neuromuscular junction and works directly uh, by inhibiting the release of acetylcholine. And as you know, acetylcholine is necessary to stimulate the muscles to contract. So without that acetylcholine, you wind up getting a flaccid paralysis, and that's pretty characteristic for botulism. Now the mechanism of disease for infants is that they ingest spores. Now remember, we talked about the spores. What will happen with an infant is that they eat something that has C. botulinum spores, like honey or sometimes even corn syrup, and that spore will get into their digestive tract and it will be able to germinate there because they don't have bacteria to compete with C. botulinum. Now with adults, that's not a problem because we've got tons of bacteria in our GI tract and Clostridium botulinum is a wimp and it's going to easily die off because all of the other bacteria will outcompete it for nutrients. So with adults, and by adults I mean anyone over the age of one, uh, it, we get disease from preformed toxins. So if you fail to kill the bacteria when you, uh, when you can it, it will begin to form toxins and then we eat those toxins and that directly causes disease. Okay, now moving on to the diseases. There are three of them, but only two of them are relevant for your stuff. And those two are foodborne botulism and infantile botulism. With foodborne botulism, this is what happens in anyone over the age of one. This is a bilateral descending paralysis that starts at the face. Now, what are some other things that do that? Myasthenia gravis is the big one. Uh, the other ones that can cause facial paralysis are Bell's palsy, that's only going to be on one side, not bilateral. Bilateral Bell's palsy can happen, but on the boards, it's going to be on one side. And typically, it, it shows up as one-sided facial paralysis. So that's just one side. Botulism is always both sides. Uh, the other thing that can cause facial paralysis is myasthenia gravis. Now, with myasthenia gravis, what they'll tell you on boards is that it gives you a positive tensilon test. Now, a tensilon test is, is where they give you edrophonium, and edrophonium, remember, is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. And so that's going to increase the amount of acetylcholine that exists at the neuromuscular junction. Remember, though, in order to have acetylcholine at all at the neuromuscular junction, you have to be able to release it. So with botulism, you're not going to have a positive edrophonium test or tensilon test because you can't release the acetylcholine in the first place. So inhibiting acetylcholine esterase is not going to help you because you don't have the acetylcholine there for it to break down. So you're not going to give, get a positive tensilon test, and if you do, it's not going to be as dramatic as you would with myasthenia gravis. So that's the difference. And then the other one is Guillain-Barre syndrome. But remember, with Guillain-Barre syndrome, that starts at the legs and works its way upwards. Um, that's an ascending paralysis. And the way I like to remember that is starts at the ground, ends at the brain. Uh, so an ascending paralysis. But botulism is a descending paralysis, a descending paralysis. So it starts out at the face. Uh, you can get diplopia, dysarthria, ophthalmoplegia, uh, impaired gag reflex, ptosis. You can see some autonomic symptoms. Uh, a lot of times dry mouth is a common way that this will start to show up. Uh, but just remember to go into your history 
within the last 48 hours, but even up to a week, uh, consumption of home canned foods, home prepared foods, exotic foods, and anything really that requires refrigeration, uh, where the food's been left out at room temperature in sealed containers or bags. Remember, this is an anaerobic bacteria, so it grows in anaerobic conditions. Um, so, yeah, so that's foodborne botulism that we see in adults. Infantile botulism that we see in infants under the age of one, this will present as poor feeding, poor head control. Basically, the baby is floppy, and that's where it gets its name, floppy baby syndrome. The, remember that this works a little differently. They may ask you in the boards how this happened. With infantile botulism, remember, it's that the baby ate something that had a spore in it, like honey. And the spore then got it into its GI tract and germinated, and now it's making toxin. With people over the age of one that get foodborne botulism, the toxin was already preformed, and so they ingested the toxin directly. Wound botulism, please don't worry about that for the step, but basically it's similar to how tetanus uh, starts out. The management is antitoxin and then supportive care. The antitoxin will only prevent the syndrome from getting worse, and then supportive care is needed to prevent what's already happening, or to, to treat what's already happening. The big problem with botulism is its potential to paralyze the muscles needed for respiration. So that's why we do the supportive care. Uh, sometimes intubation could be necessary. This is some home canned foods that I actually, I was at my parents' house not too long ago and I knew I was going to be making this video. So I went downstairs and took a picture of the canned foods that they have there. My grandma actually made this. She's 95 and she grew up during the depression. Uh, and back then, obviously, food was scarce, so she's in the habit of making sure that no food goes to waste. She is an expert at canning foods. So as far as I know, nobody's gotten botulism from her, from her canned foods, but she cans food all the time. Okay, I just wanted to briefly go into how Botox is used therapeutically. Uh, one of the big places where it's commonly used now is for the cr uh, treatment of chronic migraines. Uh, so patients who are for whatever reason resistant to all of the medication that we have for migraines, they can get Botox injected and this actually works really well to prevent migraines. It's also used to prevent a spastic bladder, uh, so urinary incontinence from detrusor overactivity when it's associated with a neurologic condition, usually multiple sclerosis. Also for other neuromuscular problems like upper limb spasticity and cervical dystonia, you see it from people that have axillary hyperhidrosis, so people who have excessive underarm sweating, you can give uh, Botox there. Blepharospasm, strabismus, and then obviously cosmetic usage. Uh, so you'll see it injected in the, uh, the upper face, uh, sort of around the eyes or the jaw lines. One way that this could come up on the test, and I figure I should just tell you, uh, is that if a patient goes to like some kind of uh, shady place, like, you know, maybe they go to some place that isn't overseen in like Tijuana or something like that where they get it done, you know, cosmetic surgery from an unlicensed practitioner, that could be a cause of botulism in a patient like that. So that's one place where you might see, I don't think that's going to be tested on boards. But anyway, if I give you uh, just a list of how Botox is used therapeutically. Our story today is going to take place at the Cola Scientist Robot Lab. Our scientist is assisted by robots because he is doing research on Clostridium botulinum. Robot botulinum, the cause of botulism. He has a couple friends with him. He's got his pet purple snake to remind you that Clostridium botulinum is a gram-positive bacillus, our recurrent symbol for a gram-positive bacillus, the purple snake. And alongside him is his trusty robot assistant standing right over here. We're going to put a mask on our mad scientist to remind you that Clostridium botulinum is an obligate anaerobe. This is a recurrent symbol for obligate anaerobes, the mask. And just as a PSA for any COVID deniers out there, 
no, surgical masks will not make you anaerobic. They do not cut off your oxygen supply. This is just a symbol for us. He's got nuts and dirt on his table as he does his research. The nuts are to remind you that Clostridium botulinum, like all the Clostridia, are spore-forming bacteria. Spore-forming bacteria. And the dirt is there to remind you that Clostridium botulinum is found in the dirt, and that is why it's so easy to get on vegetables and foods that then may be going into cans. We like to can carrots and can various vegetables, and if they're improperly canned, the toxin can be found in the foods. That toxin is botulinum toxin, which our scientist has isolated. And now, with that toxin, he is going to use his snare, and he's going to cleave the cola off his contraption. Cola for acetylcholine. Botulinum toxin cleaves a snare protein at the neuromuscular junction, thus inhibiting acetylcholine release and resulting in a flaccid paralysis. There goes our cola. But what's he done now? His robot is experiencing the consequences of a lack of acetylcholine, and now he's paralyzed at the face. Remember that botulism will start with a facial paralysis and work its way downwards. It is a descending paralysis. Oh no, look what's happened to the robot. He's now completely paralyzed with botulism. The snake left, but why did he leave? It turns out <coughs> there was a baby underneath the table all along who's gotten into the honey that was underneath the mad scientist's table. That's a no-go because with administration of honey to infants under the age of one, Clostridium botulinum spores naturally found in honey will get into the underdeveloped GI tract of the baby that does not have competing bacteria. Clostridium botulinum will germinate and begin to create toxins. Therefore, honey is never given to infants under one year of age. But no despair. Our mad scientist is not evil. He indeed has the treatment for botulism, our antidote which is to administer antitoxins post-exposure. Notice the posts by his lair, and it's antibodies on top of the post. We administer antibodies, which act against the toxin. And that is the end of our story at the Cola Scientist's Robot Lab.